I'm just going to suggest a slight change to the programme. We were going to talk about the update on research now. I think it would be much more important for you to have the expert panel and have your questions for the next 20 minutes or so, because we've already stored up a couple of important ones. So if I could ask uh, Ed and Sabina and Patrick to come up uh, to the front. Is that for Stan? Yeah, we've got a mic floating microphone. We've got two microphones or only one. Yeah. So I thought at this stage it'd be better to have your questions before we give you a bit of an update uh, on, on the research. Um, and and I guess maybe the questions we had from earlier. So um, the first question I think was uh, why not? Why sometimes do we not intervene when the aneurysm is above 5.5? Uh, I don't know, Ed, if you want to start uh, with that. Um, I, I, th I think Patrick sort of partly answered that question in that the size of your aneurysm gives you a risk of rupture. That risk may not be particularly high in the scheme of things. So a five and a half centimetre aneurysm from the studies that Asher has spoken about, actually, which are now historical studies, will suggest you run a risk of about 5% per year of that aneurysm rupturing. If you've got significant cardiac disease, you've got significant kidney disease, significantly bad lungs, and we put you under an anaesthetic, your risk of, of dying from that anaesthetic is probably as high as 10%. So it makes no sense, you know, putting you through a procedure um, that is going to be more risky to you than if we left you alone. So those decisions are made all the time, and it's about weighing up. Um, the risk versus the benefits um, to come to a sensible decision that is individualised for you. And I think one of the things that you know, hopefully you've gleaned from that is that there are different ways to treat this problem and it's about looking at the individual and coming to a sensible decision about you. And it, it doesn't go across the board just because you've got an aneurysm and someone else has got an aneurysm doesn't mean you get the same treatment. Questions? Yes, um, I, I had open surgery two, two years ago, just over two years ago, and uh, had a dual. Uh, bearing in mind my age at the time, I was two months off of 80, I did suffer quite a bit with pain afterwards in my spine, and I'm now being treated for osteoporosis of the spine. Does the epidural bearing in mind a person's height, A, would that have an effect on the spine, as opposed to a younger person? Um, age has no bearing on placement of epidural or the pain that you experience as a result of epidural. Now, there have been lots of studies in obstetric group, <coughs> pregnant women, because epidural itself will not cause backache, will not trigger backache as a complication of placing the epidural. It may be other factors. As, as you did mention, you had osteoporosis. So it may be a natural course of disease, but sometimes it could, you know, it could just trigger it a little bit. But epidural by itself will not cause a backache, per se. And this is all the research and all the studies that we've done, the data tells. So age is, I, I don't think it's quite clear that, no, it, it will not, no. <laughs> so down here, if we could wait for the microphone, just coming to you, to the gentleman in green. In making a choice as to whether to go for surgery or wait actually occurs, how much of a factor is the age of the patient? In other words, if you're in your 80s or your 90s, that must affect your decision. So, so the, the, the outside, I'll take that first and then Patrick to jump in, is that uh, it is of course against the law to discriminate against somebody on the basis of their age. Regardless of that, uh, it's, not, it's not the actual numerical age that's important. So we would say it's not your uh, 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 biological age, it's your physiological age. So there are people who are 65 who've got terrible heart disease, terrible lungs, terrible kidneys, terrible shapes like mine, uh, and, and, are, and are really a bad bet <coughs> for an anaesthetic. And there are people who are 90, 92, 93 who are 
uh, fighting fit with good hearts and good living and, and all the rest. So it's, it's actually what we call your physiological age that's important. So how healthy is your heart? How healthy are your lungs? So it's, it's the age of your heart and lungs, not the age on your birth certificate that's important. Patrick, do you want to... Yeah. And you can clap that because um, one, Ashok loves applause, and two, <laughs> and uh, two, uh, it is it is the basis of it. However, uh, an analogy I frequently use with patients in clinic is: um, if you're anyone ever been to the Isle of Wight? Yes. Yeah, lovely place. Now, if you say you're stuck on the Isle of Wight without a ferry, and there's plague on the island, <laughs> and you want to get off, so you want a boat and you want a decent sized boat and you, want a, and you want a calm day with enough wind but not too much to sail yourself across. That's the kind of way that we're trying to balance things. You want to know, if, it's, if you've only got an extremely small boat, a fairly rickety boat, then you want it to be flat calm with only a tiny breath of wind and you want the risk of you catching plague if you stay on the Isle of Wight to be quite high before you're gonna take that plunge across, across the cows, aren't you? However, if you've got a huge boat and you've got big sails and it's a nice sunny day and there's lots and lots of rampaging, plague-ridden neighbours hanging around bashing at your door, then you're going to jump straight down to the jetty. All these things come into play. How big is your aneurysm? How bad is the plague? How flat calm is it? How, how good a day is it? And that is how easy is your aneurysm to fix because there's no doubt there are some that are like an apple on a stick that we could let the registrar do almost with his eyes closed. And there are some that we sweat about for three or four weeks beforehand, planning and prepping and going through MDT after MDT to make sure we're making the right decision. And then finally, there's the anaesthetic side. There is how, how good's your boat? And um, you have to balance all these things together. La lady at the front. Can I ask that? Uh, if you can't have a stent and you have to have open surgery, uh, if you've got a big tummy, does that make it difficult? And Sorry, the... can't hear the question. Does a big tummy stop us doing an open aneurysm? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's never stopped Mr. Sedessa or me doing an open aneurysm. <laughs> 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 Slimmer patients are slightly easier to operate on, but we, you can operate on, on. It's more about how difficult the aneurysm is than how difficult the access is. I would much prefer an easy aneurysm in a, an obese patient than an extremely difficult juxta renal aneurysm in a skinny one. So, it, I mean, I think to be fair, it is a part of that equation balancing app that Mr. Lintot was talking about. Uh, and no doubt, you know, if, if you're my shape uh, and the surgeon would be put off a little bit, uh, but, but it's not, it, it, it's, it's really about, remember, and, I, and I've said it to some of you who've had surgery for me, is that uh, whatever makes life easier for the surgeon on the day is better for you, the patient. Uh, so, yes, slimmer patients are easier to operate on. Prefer non smokers. <laughs> Is there any uh, research being done on replacing the epidural? Because some people suffer terribly with an epidural and become paralyzed, scares the life out of them, and they recover because they've got no sensation in their lower legs, you know, in their legs and everything. And that's a major shock and it can take many hours for the epidural to come away and the morphine substitute kicking in. Um, so are we talking about complication, like permanent damage? Or both. both. I've known people that have actually okay. suffered permanent para being paralyzed through epidurals. And it's taken 18 months for them to get off of their bed, surgical bed, and go then into a wheelchair, crutches, etc. Are they normal now? Are they recovered? They're normal they're recovered? Now, it's taken eight years. Uh, yes, to throw away yes. The yes. No, it's a very good question, and we all are quite, you know, 
uh, aware that there is a significant risk with epidural and that is the worst possible complication that can happen is permanent nerve damage. Now, the alternative to epidural is giving a single injection of spinal anesthetics in the back, which is different from the epidural in sense that the needle is smaller, it's much finer needle, and it's a single injection at the level below where your spinal cord ends. So it is the local anesthetics is delivered into the protective covering uh, uh, within which the cerebrospinal fluid, which is a shock absorber for the spinal cord. So we just deliver the dose of local anesthesia with other medication into that as a single injection. And when we use that, we have started using that technique as well. Um, the pain relief is effective for at least for 48 hours, but not longer, but then alternatively one can uh, give morphine along with that. Yeah. So we are, we are moving away from epidural more and more. But in certain, certain um, people, it is the best form of pain relief because the single injection can make you a bit more sleepy and supplemental morphine that you take can again add to the sleepiness. And you can imagine if you're not able to move, cough, and do you know, your normal stuff, uh, as, you know, participate in physiotherapy, that can cause problems. If I can add to mm. that, so you know, obviously we're sorry to hear about that uh, person, but in fact, I, I think I can say in uh, 19 years that I've been in Oxford, no one has had that complication from an epidural in the vascular team. Uh, and and so, so it's, it's a very rare thing and, yeah. and I don't want that to put off no. other people having an epidural. And if I could also add, before we were routinely using epidurals in Oxford, and I was here then as a mm. consultant, uh, the length of stay for open aneurysms was 10 to 14 days. With the routine use of epidurals and all of our uh, 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 vascular patients are only looked after by specialists consultant vascular anesthesia, they specialise in vascular anesthesia. Our length of stay for open surgery is down to 5.5 days. It's at the top 5% of UK vascular centres. And we know the best place for patients is home, not in a hospital reliant on uh, everybody else. However good the nurses are, and I can, I, I'm going to be in real trouble with sister for telling you this, because she's been sworn to secrecy, but we've just had the patient experience questionnaires for the 44 wards in Oxford University hospitals, uh, and ward 6 say, I'm delighted to say, and this is all due to the nurses and the physios and the OTs, uh, have come third out of 44 wards in the level of care given to them by the nursing staff. Sorry, Kate. That poor individual didn't have vascular problems. Spinal operation. So, can, 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 I, can, can I quickly add? It is, it is the, still the commonest form of pain relief and most effective for any person having major surgery like liver surgeries, liver resection or Whipple's procedure, so any abdominal surgery. But we are trying to move away with the single injection, but it depends. Okay. So the lady in blue. So, so the question is about what about, is there research in the uh, uh, heritability of aneurysms? And in fact, there, there is one very large study uh, that Professor Matthew Bound, who, who's a good friend from University of Leicester, has got national funding for 4,000 patients looking at causes of aneurysms. But of course, the OxAA study that we're running here is also in large part about that uh, and about <coughs> some of the other questions that might come up which are around why do some aneurysms grow faster, others slower? Can we find a way of predicting for you who's going to go faster, who's going to grow slower? And that might answer one of the other questions someone had was why, why do we have to wait till it's five and a half? And if there's a really good way of predicting those patients that were going to get to five and a half very fast, 
And if we could do that, and, and we think we might be able to do that uh, out of the OXA study, then that would be a good way forward. As a second part of that, we've been collecting blood samples, as you know, from some of you in the audience uh, for the last two and a half years. We're very close to getting enough of them to do those heritability studies. We're fortunate that Oxford has a massive amount of science in genetics of other diseases, and we just need enough of a cohort of patients and their families to then be able to do exactly the study you talk about to find out what's causing the aneurysms in the first place. We know that tobacco smoking and high blood pressure speed up that process. Uh, and for some people who don't have a family history, that's the initiator. But this is really one of the reasons that our research group exists, is to answer exactly that question. Can I? Can I? I can give you some vague figures that are from some very bad papers in the 90s that Ashok probably doesn't want to mention. But we used to say uh, the, the basic data that we have um, from mainly from an Irish population was that you have, if your father has an aneurysm, then you have about a one, and you're a male offspring, you have about a one in six to one in eight chance of developing an aneurysm uh, compared with the national average of about one in 50 for Caucasian males. Does that kind of, that's ballpark. We'll, it, obviously, um, proper data will give you a much more accurate as to whether it's one or zero. Uh, and the other really important bit of information is that if uh, you're a man with an abdominal aortic aneurysm, then your first degree male relatives, so Brother. brothers, uh, and sons uh, should have their first scan at the age of 50 and then every five years because we know that that's a much higher uh, likelihood of picking up whereas for the general population you know you'd have to scan hundreds of thousands of people at the age of 50 and 55 and you wouldn't find enough aneurysms to make it a cost effective or even a worthwhile thing for patients to turn up. So you'd have a lot of people who are worried well, who turn up for the scans. The people who really need them don't turn up, mm. and it wouldn't change anything. But if you've got someone with a male in the family with an aneurysm, first scan at 50, 55, 60, 65 into the national program. Lady, lady, lady with white hair. <laughs> That's a lot of you. <laughs> I'm just joking. That's... That's the majority of the audience. Know, <laughs> and I'm getting close. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, why do more men than women have this? Yeah. Uh, we'll get everything. We're unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we are officially the weaker sex. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not designed to last as long as you are. <laughs> but, but, but we are catching up. So the life expectancy of, of women in the UK... Uh, now uh, is 88 and men used to be 78 is now up to 83 so we're, we're catching up and we're, we're nearly going to be as good as you soon but do you know why you have the men have this no, no we don't and, and the genetic studies will help us understand that we're, we're just waiting to recruit enough patients in, into our study to try and answer that we've got the science ready uh, we just need enough patients and samples yeah. to do the next bit Interestingly, we do know that women who do get aneurysms, they tend to be more complicated and tortuous. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want Patrick to let me say that women are just more difficult. But, uh, I think complex is probably a better word. <laughs> so, lady there. I was just about the states that you have to send to Australia to have been made in Australia. Mm. Um, does, that, does that mean that you have a... If someone goes in and has to have a, an emergency, well, not emergency operation, but a quick operation, they would have to have something in, inferior to, to that? Um, uh, not necessarily. I mean, again, I think if you came in with an urgent problem, there are other ways that we could treat. We'll consider open surgery. And actually, here in Oxford, we're pretty, dare I say, we're pretty good at it. And, um, uh, and, uh, and we get a lot of people through. So open surgery is always an option. If that is not an option, there are other devices that we have expertise in using there. The one that I showed you was a picture of something called a thoracic branch device. And that's actually an off-the-shelf device. So I, we can get that from a company fairly quickly, um, providing you know, the, the shape of the aneurysm is suitable for it. 
and we can use this off-the-shelf device. The other thing that we're also developing with the newer um, stent graft, which I told you about sealing with bags, is to be able to put stents alongside those bags into those difficult um, um, target vessels and seal everything from below. And that's becoming more and more popular. So uh, the, the, it's changing quite rapidly about what we can offer people. And, um, but I think you, you know, one needs to be aware that it's about the long-term durability. But for some people, these stand graphs will be more than enough. They'll be durable enough. You know, one thing that you're certain of is that we're not, you know, we're not all going to live forever. <laughs> In fact, none of us are going to live forever. So at some point, you've just got to tailor your treatment to the individual. And, um, and that's important. But there are techniques out there to deal with emergent problems. And if I could just add to that, one of the things that perhaps didn't come over today is that we do have this weekly meeting called the Multidisciplinary Team. Uh, and the whole ethos of it is to find uh, a patient come to, uh, to us who is reaching the threshold for, for intervention, uh, you'd have the heart test and sometimes a lung test and a few of the preoperative tests and we bring all of that information together to the MDT with the scans uh, and we have a panel of the consultants there, so usually between four and eight uh, surgeons, uh, three to five radiologists, uh, a couple of the anaesthetists and the technologists and the rest of the team and we would discuss each case looking at the shape of the aneurysm, uh, all of the other factors around the heart function, kidney function, uh, etc. Uh, and then to try and find what is the correct uh, options for the patient and then come back to you. And sometimes we'll have had an initial discussion with you and say, well, you know, of the two main options, what would you prefer? Why would you prefer that? And have that initial discussion. We will then have a discussion and say, what's technically possible? And then would come back to you with the recommendation of one to two uh, options. So the, the, the whole purpose of it is to try and find the individualized, personalized solution for you that fits you and what's important to you best. Uh, and, and our job is really trying to find a solution. And sometimes the solution might be actually any of the treatments available, and we've now got, as I said, the whole array available to us in Oxford, is not right for you. Because even one of those complex things it has risks attached to it, and it may be that your underlying risk uh, of, of rupture is so relatively low that you're better off just living with that aneurysm for a bit longer. So it's about finding an individual solution. And one thing I think I, I have said to a number of you before the audience is, if the surgeon doesn't want to operate, there must be a really good reason, because our intrinsic <laughs> behaviour is to want to do stuff. You know, we're all those boy, boys and girls who like playing with Meccano and stuff. We like doing things and fixing things. And if we don't want to fix it, there must be a really good reason. And the good reason is we don't want to kill you. <laughs> Are there other questions? Okay, I think it must be a good time for us to move on to give you an update uh, on research. Uh, thank you to the panel.